I wanted to change gears somewhat in this video, and rather than continuing with a roughly chronological look at the essence energy distinction, to jump forward to the Middle Ages, as well as backwards to more Neoplatonic thinkers. One book that is worth reading in order to understand the Western medieval perspective on power and energy in God is Lawrence Moonan's Divine Power, the Medieval Power Distinction up to its adoption by Albert Bonaventure and Aquinas. The power distinction as outlined in this book, effectively sought to answer the question of whether it is truthful to say that God can do other than what he does. As Moonan writes, many of the schoolmen could not claim to say anything intelligible about what God may have it in him to do, but does not do. Most, if not all of the schoolmen examined below, for example, maintained or sought to maintain a rigorously negative theology on the nature of God, a view to the effect that nothing we understand may be affirmed properly and with truth of the divine nature. And we see here and throughout Moonan's book that God is understood to refer univocally to the divine nature, which directly contradicts the Cappadocian fathers in St. John of Damascus, who said that the divine nature has no name. This conflation of the divine power and the divine nature leads to all kinds of problems, and necessitates a virtual distinction in God to allow certain predications to be made of him without applying a positive statement to the divine essence, simpliciter. As Moonan writes, Throughout, I translate de potentia ordinata as in option tied power and de potentia absoluta as in option neutral power. The option in question is the actual concrete order of created things, seen as God's option or volitum. The tie is that in such assertions as God can in option tied power blank, what goes in the blank, say, make there to be grunting pigs, is being understood to stand for some or other thing subject to God's actual ordering of things. In other words, to stand for some or all of the actual order of things. It will be true only if there are grunting pigs in the actual order of things, and the truth of the assertion when it is true is tied to their actually being the things referred to. In such assertions as God can in option neutral power blank, what goes in the blank, say, make there to be flying pigs, is to be understood as referring to the thing in question in its abstract, intrinsic content merely, and prescinding from its actually being ordered into existence or not. The assertion will be true when it is true, in virtue of the intrinsic consistency of the content of the thing envisaged, prescinding from whether or not such a thing is ever going to be actualized. For a distinction to be made in this way, attributions to God's power to do things extrinsic to his nature are going to have to be treated as systematically misleading. This is systematically misleading only with regards to a certain conception of God's power, owing to a different reading of St. Dionysius the Areopagite in the West. I think it is fair to say that this is a misreading of apophaticism, or negative theology, by which the West thought that we could say nothing about God except what has been revealed within the created order, and this results from an association of God as active potency, and first actuality as it were whereas only his created effects are understood to be second actuality, as I discussed in the last video. Moonen frames this presentation in terms of an essentialist theory of universals. I don't think this is just a quirk of his, but rather that it stems from the material he is researching. Creation in the medieval West is presented here as just an instantiation in matter of a form which pre-exists in the divine intellect. This is precisely not what St. Maximus taught about the Logoi, as we saw in the last video. Both form and matter, the entire nature of creatures, is created ex nihilo, not just the material support for a nature, or its particular instantiations. Because of its debt to Aristotle, this medieval kind of realism has much in common with Neoplatonic thought, as well as some significant differences. If we remember the video on Proclus, we saw that his cosmology asserted a concept of the paradigm, which he distinguished from the one itself, although it did not constitute a hypostasis in the Platinian sense. Rather, the paradigm was Proclus's term for the totality of forms existing in the capital I intellect or nous. So far, this is very similar to a medieval real history of forms and universals. We will also recall that what Proclus called the dyad was the first emanation from the one, the dyad being the opposition of pure act and pure potentia, or prime matter. The important point is that these two are simultaneously produced from the one. 
We also saw in the last video that for Saint Maximus, the pure actuality of the divine energies does not exist relative to anything passive. The divine energies for Saint Maximus do not follow from an understanding of hylomorphism, but are understood to manifest the hypostatic relations. Unlike the Neoplatonists, Saint Maximus understood that differentiation did not entail division or a state of diminished perfection relative to the One. Rather, God's love manifests eternally in the Trinity, even as it proceeds from the hypostasis of the Father and is thus distinct from the essence. This precise notion of energetic manifestation is, I argued in the last video, missing from the Thomistic accounts of the Trinity. I think one can even make a grammatical argument for this from the Bible. When God said to Moses, I am that I am, we can, for the sake of argument at least, break this down into the terms we have been examining. I is a revelation of personhood, hypostasis, in this case the explicit reference to the Father, according to some church fathers. Am is a reference to essence, the being of God which is beyond being as we understand it. And the conjunction that is a reference to the energetic manifestation, which is, as it were, the self-referencing of God in the Trinitarian relationships. For if one should say, I am being, we lack the sense of completeness that comes with the Trinity. Indeed, we are left only with a sense of equivalence or strict identity between person and nature, the confusion of which, St. John of Damascus said, was the root of all heresy. The essence-energy distinction is thus implicit in God's revelation to Moses, for it is presupposed in the self-referencing form of the statement. And for self-referencing to be possible, for God to know himself, there needs to be a perfect communion between the three divine persons, a communion of love specifically, and a love which is not reducible to a person or to the nature. I bring this up because we see the notion of power and activity redefined by the Church Fathers specifically to combat the Neoplatonic and Aristotelian assumptions about activity as something necessarily directed towards a passive recipient. This background sometimes goes unnoticed in debates between Orthodox and Thomists, for instance, because it is simply assumed that for Thomas to adopt Aristotelian metaphysics, he can incorporate the understanding of creation ex nihilo without arriving at any difficulties. The problem, therefore, is one of ignorance, and I do not mean to apportion any blame by saying this. Ignorance, that is, of the context of Christianity and Neoplatonism in the late antique world. As Dr. David Bradshaw has said, I believe, when the West discovered Aristotle and the solutions he offered to certain problems in Plato, they took him as the pinnacle of philosophy, without having access to those philosophers who had followed Aristotle historically. If you'll forgive the expression, the Western scholastics were playing without a full deck of cards, so while we can't hold them to blame for things outside their understanding, we can still call out the limitations inherent in a strictly Aristotelian framework. Now ideally we want to keep what is good from Aristotle, and yet move beyond the limitations of his metaphysics. I think that orthodoxy succeeds in this, without however offering a complete metaphysic in the sense defined by Aristotle. This is another tricky point which I touched on in the first video in this series. For from a paradigmatic standpoint, Aristotelianism presents a closed system. That is its beauty in a sense, but also its danger. A closed system elevates our mental concepts to a status they do not really possess. That is why for the Church Fathers, theology is never a purely rational enterprise. There is always a rational account that can be given for our theology, but at the level of fundamental categories such as person, will and nature, we cannot define these within a purely logical framework. They are terms so primitive that they must be defined negatively or apophatically. Thus person or hypostasis, for instance, cannot be defined as the individual merely. Aristotle himself anticipated this view when he listed the categories. He said that these highest level genera, so to speak, have no account. That is, they are so primitive they form the fundamental level of the entire system or metaphysic. But to define them except in relation to the other categories would be to admit that there is some category even more primitive and basic which preceded them. Saint Maximus, in his Ambiguum 10, talks about the categories, not Aristotle's work specifically, but the highest level genera of our experience. Yet he maintains that while these have a basis in God's divine attributes, they are, as concepts, contingent and created. In other words, they do not shine a direct light into necessity in terms of God's nature. Thus we cannot cobble together a theology proper 
based merely on the categories, because that would be to define the necessary in terms of the contingent. Rather, there are limits to natural contemplation, as he calls it, and these limits are the categories themselves. These categories are a kind of revelation. They are the framework in which we view the world by means of our reason. However, there is a sense in which we can view things in a mode that goes beyond reason, that is, noetically, and the noose is that faculty which beholds the uncreated, the logoi or God's wills. By setting himself the categories as the limit of reason, Aristotle knowingly excluded the kind of noetic contemplation that was the goal of Plato and the Neoplatonists, Plotinus especially. I stress this point, by setting himself the categories as the limit of reason, Aristotle knowingly excluded the kind of noetic contemplation that was the goal of Plato and the Neoplatonists. Indeed, Plotinus had very little time for Aristotle, and at several points tries to demonstrate his redundancy in relation to the Platonic corpus. It's very important to bear this in mind as context for Thomism. Because Aristotle consciously limits himself to natural contemplation and natural philosophy, he never intended to do theology proper, because that would exceed the limits of his own system of thinking about the world. If we conflate natural philosophy and theology proper, we end up with natural theology, a kind of bastardised version of both. This only becomes possible, moreover, if we lack the proper distinction between created and uncreated, which the Cappadocians and their successors were so keen to stress at every point. This cuts to the heart of the problem which Greek philosophy could never solve on its own, the problem of divine conceptualism. If there is no creation as such, in terms of a voluntary, contingent act, then the categories according to which creation is received by the mind are themselves of the same status qua emanations from the one. Aristotle is better than the Platonists in some ways because he admits that the categories are a limit. This might be a reason why Plotinus rejected his philosophy so vehemently. For the Neoplatonists, contemplation of the forms is something purely noetic. Yet so long as we understand the forms to be multiple and not one, we have not restored our nous to the status of the divine intellect, the capital N, nous, which is the first emanation from the one. In other words, as long as we consider particulars as particulars, we have not reached the status of the gods, who share one mode of intellection which is completely simple, even as it is distinct from the one itself. There is no way for Proclus that the one can be identical to the act of thinking, as it was in Aristotle. Rather, the pure act of Aristotle is for Proclus and Plotinus especially, the first emanation from the one. The one is for the Neoplatonists, that which holds all things together and which bestows unity on all things. But insofar as it is absolutely simple, it cannot be conflated with its emanations. The kind of irreducible complexity of Aristotle's categories, then, would have been anathema to Plotinus, because the core Neoplatonic presupposition maintains that there will always be a higher genus capable of containing the lower genera, culminating in the one itself which is beyond intellect, but which produces intellect. As long as one can distinguish quality from quantity, substance from accident, etc., one has not attained the perfect noesis of the gods. So Aristotle is in a sense a standard bearer for creatures, in asserting the value of rational contemplation in its own right. This is not to say that rational contemplation exists for its own sake, but that it has a value in the big picture, so to speak. This approach of Aristotle's is ultimately incoherent without a doctrine of creation. So Plotinus is correct in a sense if he were to accuse Aristotle of paying attention arbitrarily to natural contemplation and natural philosophy. Without a biblical worldview, Aristotelianism is ultimately arbitrary. We can recognise perhaps something providential, nevertheless, in the fact that Aristotle was so invested in solving certain problems of natural philosophy, but he lacked the big picture, not having access to revelation. Now we are in a better position to critique natural theology, so-called, for it is the extrapolation of a certain Aristotelian methodology to answer questions that that methodology was never intended to address. The Neoplatonists had no qualms about denying the law of non-contradiction, for instance, at the level of the paradigm, that is, the forms in the divine intellect. If we confuse the created and the uncreated, however, we are stuck in a dialectic where we must either assert a law of non-contradiction in the one or else deny it in the created order.
That is why we are ultimately trapped with a dyad in Neoplatonism. As soon as we descend from the absolute simplicity of the One, there is automatically an opposition which introduces contradiction. Orthodox Christianity, on the contrary, by beginning with the revelation of God as Trinity, permits us to speak of an essence-energies distinction in God, and offers an account for the voluntary, contingent act of creating the world. God is understood to be one and many without introducing a contradiction and, just as crucially, without an arbitrary violation of what we call the law of non-contradiction. God, of course, is not subject to any law, yet logic as we understand it is a reflection of God's eternal logoi, and thus it can guide us to a truth which is not inherently deceitful and which need not be wholly negated because the logoi are not absolutely one in the neoplatonic sense. If logic and the categories such as Aristotle championed are a reflection and creation of God's eternal logoi, then we have a valid reason to adhere to these categories in some sense, and not seek to escape creation as if it were a prison for the intellect. Rather, our calling is to deify creation by uniting our wills to God's will, following the example of Christ.